Good morning and welcome to City Hall. We'll get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. John Heffernan is the pastor at Harvest Hills Baptist Church. He'll lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman Pat Ryan to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to come to be before your presence. We thank you for your blessings to us. We thank you for your faithfulness to us as our God. We thank you for this government you placed over us. And we pray that you would ask, we would ask today that you would give wisdom today and the discussion and the words today that everything that is said would, would be truthful, would be kind, would be pleasing to you. We ask for the uh, wisdom as they discuss the matters of the city. Again, we thank you for your direction and your provision in our life and in protecting us and, and giving us the safety and blessing our city as you have. We give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. April is a Police Appreciation Month, and we have some police officers in the in the office. With us. Chief, you want to come up? Why don't you bring up the, the guys that, that thought they were just sitting around uh, uh, protecting us? But we're going to bring them up here and, and make them part of the show. We have a proclamation. I'll ask the clerk to read it. Whereas police officers make a valuable contribution to our community by serving and protecting our citizens. And whereas the dedication and desire of Oklahoma City police officers to preserve a peaceful quality of life for all citizens is their foremost goal. And whereas daily life-threatening hazards are an accepted requirement of the profession and most appreciated by a grateful public. Whereas certain events within the month of May lend themselves towards the positive recognition of Oklahoma City law enforcement personnel. And whereas the following activities are planned. May 1st, National Law Day. May 3rd, Oklahoma City Police Department Awards Banquet. May 10th, Oklahoma City Police Department Memorial Service. May 10th, Oklahoma State Law Enforcement Memorial Service. May 12th through 18th is National Police Week. And concluding May 15th with National Police Officers Memorial Day. Now therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim the month of May 2013 as Police Appreciation Month in Oklahoma City in recognition of the outstanding performance, service, and competence exhibited by the Oklahoma City police officers. Let's show our appreciation to our police officers. Thank you very much. Chief, we really appreciate your work this year. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I said April was Police Appreciation Month. It is May. So I guess I'm going to appreciate them both months, but you only are required to appreciate them in May. Yeah, that's right, okay. We'll make it all year long then. Uh, we're also uh, bringing our firefighters up this morning because it is time for the Fill the Boot campaign with the Muscular Dystrophy, Muscular District, <coughs> Muscular Dystrophy Association. And it uh, looks like we have hats to pass out. We have a proclamation, I'll ask the clerk to read it as we get settled. Whereas the Oklahoma City Professional Firefighters Association, Local 157, is hosting the annual Fill the Boot campaign to benefit the Muscular Dystrophy Association, MDA. Whereas the firefighters have partnered with the MDA since 1954 and freely give their time to Fill the Boot and other MDA campaigns throughout the year. Whereas in 2012, Oklahoma City firefighters, through the overwhelming generosity of Oklahoma City residents, raised over $239,000 for the MDA. And whereas these donations support continued research of neuromuscular diseases and help over 2,000 families in Oklahoma with critical medical services and supplies for loved ones affected by these diseases. 
Now, therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim May 6th through 11th as firefighter Phil the Boot Week in Oklahoma City, and he urges all citizens to support this worthwhile cause. Let's show our appreciation of both MDA and our firefighters, and I'm going to uh, allow Brittany Griner with the MDA to tell us more about their wonderful cause. Well, thank you, and I would like to thank the Oklahoma City Fire Department for all of their support with MDA and um, all of the community. Um, they raised over $230,000 last year, and we have a goal for $300,000 this year. So we would like to ask for all of your support and really like to thank you ahead of time for all of that. Thank you. All right. Sounds like some of that responsibility comes on us. So let's be out there and let's fill the boot uh, with our firefighters helping out. And I want to thank Phil Seid for coming out, too. Let's show our appreciation one more time to MDA. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd like to caution the firefighters to be careful out there. <clears throat> Standing in the middle of the streets is a dangerous sort of thing. Councilman Ryan, I was just sharing the same thing with Councilman Greenwell. Please be careful out on the streets, okay? Safety vests aren't going to help you the whole way around, so be careful. <laughs> With the meeting called to order, we have item 3A. This is an appointment of Mike Dover to the Bond Advisory Committee. Second. All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 4 is the Journal of Council Proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for April 23rd. And item 4B is to approve the Journal of Council Proceedings for April 16th. Any comments or questions on the journal? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 5 is a request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, a couple this morning. On the consent docket, uh, we need to strike item on page six, item 6Q. Um, this item will be brought back. To, it should be on the, P, on the OCPPA agenda. So we'll bring that back at a future meeting and put it on that agenda. On page seven, items to, for individual consideration, item 8A2, PUD 1476. The applicant has requested that this item be deferred until April, I'm sorry, until September 10th. Uh, this has been deferred several times. The applicant has prepared a PUD to allow a second phase to this pr proposed development. The second PUD is currently pending planning commission review, and this deferral will allow the two items to be heard at the same council meeting. So again, we're deferring until September 10th, item 8A2, it's PUD 1476. And then on to page eight, under item 8E1, item A, 3112 South Klein, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has removed. Item I, 1417 Southwest 35th, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has removed. Moving on to item 8F1B, 3210 North Francis, we ask that that be stricken, owner has secured. Item E, 2413 Northwest 2nd Street, ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item H, 1222 Northwest 13th Street, ask that that be stricken, there's a new owner. Moving to page nine, item L, 2804 Northwest 23rd Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And item P, 1905 Northeast 27th Street. We ask that that be stricken. Again, the owner has secured. All right, any other requests for uncontested continuances? We'll recess the council meeting, convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. There are three items. All right, comments or questions on the MFA? Mayor, I did just have a quick uh -huh. question on A, if I could. Jim, is this a new program, this RFP for private investigation? No, no we, we, we've, uh, on the investigative services, no, okay. we've had an investigator uh, for, for many, many years. Great, well, I highly applaud it. I just didn't see if this was a replacement, but great program. All right, ready to vote the MFA? Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCMFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. There are three items. Comments or questions on the PPA? Question, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, as it relates to uh, item B, um, why does the river look so trashy east of uh, Eastern uh, Avenue? Uh, I don't know if I have an answer to that. Uh, you're talking about uh, below the Eastern Dam? 
to these? Yes. Um, I, I don't know if I know the answer to that. We can certainly have crews go out and take a look at that. All right, thank you. All right, ready to vote the PPA? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, just the claims and payroll today. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT, reconvene the council meeting with a consent docket. Move the item subject to individual consideration. All right, are there any individual considerations? Your Honor, uh, R is in Romeo. And, uh, excuse me for a moment, don't. And uh, J is in July. Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. 10, oh, excuse me, T and U. K1, K1, please, Nick. Okay, Pat, R. Excuse me, R. Uh, R. This is uh, has to do with the, uh, our own city's ability to self-insure, and uh, do we have any feeling at all what the current legislation is being proposed and uh, on changing workman's comp would have on the city's operation? We haven't we haven't following the legislation very very closely, and and it's going to have significant change in, in our process. Okay, whenever it's uh, it's uh, finalized, I would appreciate if we could have some kind of report. Sure. But if, if, if it has an operational impact as well as a financial impact. We'd be happy to do that. All right, and item J, Pat? Item J, you know, where the building is being, uh, Wesley, Old Wesley Hospital is being added to the uh, National Register of Historic Places. Who owns that building? I can't answer that, Russell. Uh, I, I don't know the owners, I know that uh, Within the last six months, uh, the, or probably within the last 12 months, the property did change hands and that uh, the new owners are looking to rehabilitate that building, so. And the, and the new but owners are open to the idea of placing on a historic? Facility. They're requesting it. Yes, they, they requested requesting. it. These are always, when we get these, these are always requests from the owner. Okay, now, not always, we've had one at least where the owner didn't know about it, so. Okay. But I think it's, it's uh, important that we have the owners participate in these things because it, it doesn't right now put any extraordinary requirements on the piece of property, but it may in the future, and I think it, the owner ought to be appraised of that fact and we, as we go forward. I guess that's all. Thank you. Pat, Pat I think uh, the new owners were before us sometime within the last year to ask our support for getting some money from the Oklahoma Housing Finance Authority. Or yes, it's a low income tax credit project. We, we've signed um, an application to help them rehab the project at some point. Rehab is fine. Right. I understand that. The, the, the adding it to national, right. the list of national historic properties is different because I know I was with the company one time. We were surprised. We found out one of our buildings had been nominated in place on that list. It, it is on their own volition. They do it for the tax credits. Right. Thank you. All right. Uh, John, item T. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, item T. Uh, who, do, who determined the locations of the sidewalks? That was a, lar a significant process. It was before the council, it was before the MAPS 3 subcommittee. Criteria was established uh, uh, on that, and a long list of, uh, of, of sidewalks was established based upon that criteria that was adopted by the master plan. Okay, can I get a, that list, please? Absolutely. Thank you. And item U, John? Okay, item U, uh, courses in Ward 7, I'm glad to have uh, this project in Ward 7, first of all. Um, but I do have some concerns as it relates to the increase of engineering fees. Uh, and then also the construction uh, costs uh, has increased uh, $7 million. Um, is there any assurance that this project um, will not keep uh, increasing? There are no assurances on any project, but our goal is to maintain scope and costs on all the projects. That's Mr. Todd's number one charge is to make sure the MAP3 comes in under budget. The scope increase for the engineering fees is simply going from a conceptual drawing, and that's what they were asked to do, and now they're going into design of, the, uh, of it. So this is moving from one phase to another. It is not a change 
of, of a scope creep or anything with the engineering. It's merely moving from one phase of, 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 the, of the project into a, a, another phase. Great. On the project cost, David? <coughs> there's, within the MAPS projects, there's different light items in there, and the line item that you're looking at as far as the increase is where it says land acquisition and site prep. And part of the site prep includes some utility movements and uh, significant dirt work for this project because the, the Whitewater facility will have about 21 feet of dirt placed in there. So, so those fees will roll in there also for the design fee to, to sh better reflect what they will be designing. But the program, we have a program implementation plan that was adopted uh, on MAP3 and it's, it's roughly $60 million to be put into the river. And there's a lot of different phases on there. And they know that there's not 61 million, but they know that there's 60, 60 million dollars, or roughly about that amount of money. So we are very uh, cognizant of the cost as, as we go through each phases of the project. All right, thank you. Larry, item K1. Yeah, Eric, just to see if I'm familiar, if I could. Uh, on K1, uh, this is the uh, approval to uh, announce for bid the uh, streetscape project on Northwest 23rd Street from uh, Ann Arbor to uh, Tulsa, yes. and this will go out to bids. A contractor will be selected as a result of that, and then that's preparatory to the actual work beginning sometime this summer. Right. We expect work to begin in June of 13 and finish up next summer 14. And this is the same schedule that was announced to our residents at the, the meeting uh, back the first part of April, and I just want to let them know that we're right on schedule for what was announced and the, the project is progressing. We are. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? We have a motion and a second. Let's vote. And it passes unanimously. On the concurrence docket, just one item today over at the Civic Center. Okay, comments or questions on item 7A? All right. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 8 begins a series of items that require a separate vote. First is a zoning case in Ward 8. It's an ABC issue at 14020 North May Avenue. Pat? Thank you, Your Honor. Francis, anybody sign up to speak on this one? Uh, this is a, a, a restaurant, an area of restaurants. I, uh, I didn't. And uh, the owner's representative is here this morning. Good morning, sir. If we have any questions, we can turn to him. Uh, but so far, it looks like a, a, a good application. There's lots of, of restaurants in that area that serve alcohol now, so it's not a new facility at all. Uh, if there aren't any questions, uh, I would move approval. Second. All right. No one has signed up to speak. Is there anyone here wishing to speak against this approval? All right, let's go ahead and vote. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. The item is approved. Thank you. Item 8B is a zoning case. Well, no, it's not. It's just a closed 20-foot alley in Ward 6. This is uh, located between Walker and Dewey, north of 8th Street. We have one person that has signed up to speak, Meg. All righty. Um, I think... You I wasn't listening carefully, Mayor, but you probably said this was brought to us last week and we deferred for a week. Um, I'm, the purpose of that deferral was to assure that you had the opportunity to speak with uh, Mr. Hollis. Yes, yes, uh, Bo Patterson for the applicant SSM Healthcare. This was our application to close the alley and uh, Mr. Hollis of Hollis Properties, the owner of the Century Hotel, and I have had a chance to work out an easement agreement that we think will allow us to secure the parking lot properly and also provide him with the access that he needs to uh, get to the back of his building in the event that he needs to move heavy equipment back there or maintain the area behind his building. We've reduced that to a riding and we're gonna be executing that and getting it properly uh, authorized. Um, and, and Mr. Hollis is here today to add his acknowledgement to the record. Thank you, Mr. Hollis, if you would mind. At this time, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, withdraw my objection to the uh, closing of the alley. And also I'd like to thank Mr. Patterson and uh, Mr. Mobley at St. Anthony Hospital. We worked together and we got this done where I think it's win-win to, to all. So Wonderful. I thank the city council for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you very much Wonderful. for coming down. Given those facts, I would move approval. Second. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. On to item 8C, and this item is up for final hearing today. This has to do with the Paseo District. Second. Okay. Comments or questions here? Did anyone show up today hoping to speak on item 8C? All right. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Mayor, the uh, municipal council's office would like the emergency. Okay. Second. Right. Cast your votes on the emergency on item 8C, and it passes 8-0.
Item 8D uh, has to do with some uh, uses of trucks for recreational uses down on Lake Atoka. Yeah, yeah, this item is just being introduced today and a public hearing will be set for a couple of weeks out. Marcia. We have a motion and a second. Yeah, Marsha. Thank you. I have just a couple of quick questions. We maintain Lake Atoka, of course, and the, the large property that we hold there. It has some rural roads on the property. We have a great access down to our pump station, but generally the roads are gravel uh, um, and not able to hold heavy traffic. We're seeing some great industrial development in southeastern Oklahoma, uh, but we want to keep those very large uh, uh, trucks, for example, log haulers, off the roads because they just can't handle it. It's not safe. Okay. And this has been through the Lake Atoka Reservation Association, so this is a joint recommendation by the, the folks from the city of Atoka. Yes, this came at the recommendation the of the Atoka Police Department. All right. Cast your votes then on item 8D, and it passes unanimously. Item 8E is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any item listed under 8E? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 8F is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any item listed under 8F? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. And it passes unanimously. Uh huh. Did I miss somebody's hand? Yes, yeah, sir, did you? Want to speak on item 8F? Uh, yeah, well, come on up, and we'll we'll figure it out when you get here. All right. It, we'll we'll need your name and address for the record. Charles Houck, uh, owned the property at 732 Southwest 28. Okay, and that is listed under 8F for unsecured structures. It's a, a property in Ward 4, and Councilman White is is absent today. What can you tell us about this property? Is well. Uh, I've basically secured it now and uh, in the process of, you know, changing out some bad boards to, for my painting and everything, and I basically have it secured. What are you going to do with this property? Uh, it'll be either for sale or a rental property. Okay. So you've been fixing it up? Yeah. And it, it's been, how long has it's, it been in disrepair? Uh, quite a while. They've... Uh, broke in and stole all the copper and wiring and stuff, which is kind of set me back on. How long have you been the property owner? I'm sorry? How long have you been the property owner? Uh, since 1984. Okay. When's the last time somebody was living in there? Probably about 10 months ago. Okay. Charles, what can you tell us about it? Well, this is just one for being unsecured. He has two weeks in which to complete. If he's already done it, we'll... we'll schedule a reinspection and then we'll clear it off if that's the case. Okay. Well, why don't we do this? If you'll just work with our staff, it sounds like you've already got some work done. Just make sure that you keep in touch with them and so they can get out there and and uh, and, and we'd love to have this, you know, uh, back as a viable property. So thanks for your attention. I'm sorry about the uh, the, the vandalism that apparently took place in the property. All right. Thanks. We're going to go ahead and keep it on the list, but if you'll work with staff, it should, should work out fine. Okay. All right. Thanks. We've already voted on 8F, is that right? Okay. We're on to 8G, and this is a public hearing regarding the consolidated plan. Did anyone show up today hoping to speak on item 8G? Okay. Looks like we have a presentation from staff. Uh, brief presentation, Mayor. Um, consolidated plan. We do this every year. Uh, it is the document that we are required to prepare to comply with our uh, reporting requirements for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So uh, we prepare a five-year plan, but we, we have to modify that every year, so that is called an action year plan, and this is the uh, fourth action year plan out of the current five-year plan. Uh, this addresses the following grants, the Community Development Block Grant, which is the majority of the federal funds that we get in, in one single unit, the uh, Home Investment Partnerships, or the Home Grant, uh, Emergency Solutions Grant, and then the HOPA, or the Housing, for, Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS Grant. Uh, as you can see here, the history of HUD funding is uh, not an illustrious one in recent times. Uh, we've gone from a peak of $9.5 million 
in 2010 to what our expected funding is in the coming year of uh, six and a half million. So it continues to go down, uh, need goes up, but uh, supply goes down. So obviously that makes it more challenging for us in terms of meeting the intent of these grants. And you can see with each of the individual grants here, uh, we're anticipating about $4 million from CDBG in the upcoming year. We don't have the, the, um, the final uh, amount yet. Uh, the feds are a little slow on getting these numbers out. We also don't know what the effect of the sequester will be yet as well. So this is a forecast on what we think those funds will be in the, in the coming year. So approximately $4 million for CDBG, uh, 1.7 for home, about 400,000 for the emergency services grant, and then Hopware a little under 500,000. Uh, we go through an extensive citizen engagement process because uh, their input is really vital to determining what the priorities for the expenditures of these funds are. We began that in January with a general public meeting that we hold out at the uh, Homeless Alliance campus at Westtown. Um, we have a citizens committee that is comprised of representatives from each of the wards and at-large members and they, uh, when we present this information to them, and they are able to vet it in terms of the way we allocate the priorities. Uh, we have a public notification period, also the Neighbourhood Conservation Committee, and, and it's before you today so that we can get it to uh, Housing and Urban Development by May the 15th. That is their deadline. So without a, a CDBG, I mean, we cover a lot of different initiatives out of all of these funds. Some of the primary um, programs that we support with CDBG, uh, housing rehabilitation, the Strong Neighbourhoods Initiative, which is a new initiative we started several years ago to be able to target our funds in particular neighbourhoods and have a greater effect. Uh, and we also provide money for the Urban Renewal Authority to assist with uh, blight removal, as, as well as some of these other smaller programs. With the home program, um, we have a down payment assistance program that helps generally in excess of uh, 100 different homeowners a year. Uh, extensive housing rehabilitation program, which run by uh, Bob Daly out of my staff. And, and then we are also allocating funds out of home to the Strong Neighborhoods Initiative to combine with the CDBG so that we can be more effective in delivery of that program. Uh, and community housing development organizations, we have uh, three of those, and those assist in uh, constructing housing in some of our target neighbourhoods as well. Uh, emergency shelter grant is largely direct, is, is directed at, at homeless, so it supports uh, homeless prevention, shelter operations, rapid rehousing, which is where we're trying to uh, uh, redirect efforts. That is a directive from Housing and Urban Development to focus more less on the, on the temporary solutions and more on the permanent solutions. So the uh, ESG grant helps us with that. And then Hopper is, is similar kind of services but targeted for uh, people with AIDS. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We do have a handout that has a lot more detail on the breakdown uh, of, of how those grants are dispersed, but it's, uh, it's a little too complex to go into in detail. Uh, in this forum, so I'd be happy to discuss any of those with you at any point. Any questions? Questions for Russell regarding 8G? I, I think really I'd just like to compliment Steve uh, and his staff for the great work they do, you know, as these resources. I served on this committee for about 10 years, and t to be looking at a budget of only six and a half million dollars is really surprising, and so you know, we really do stretch those dollars, uh, I think, to maximum usefulness and um, you know it's it's tough we we don't seem to have extra money to do extra projects as those budgets are cut but um, it provides very valuable services and so thank you very much so difficult and, th and thanks for recognizing staff because Steve and and Shannon who is, is new to the staff has been with us for seven months now um, I mean my staff do an excellent job and in, in terms of the re reporting requirements, we are a stellar program in the country. Uh, we don't have findings. We don't have any of the issues that a lot of other communities have. So uh, we do a great job. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. And I'll remind again, this is a public hearing. Did anyone show up today to speak on item 8G? All right. How about a vote then to move this forward? Move the item. Motion to approve. And a second. Cast your votes. 
passed unanimously. Item 8H comes to us from the, the Water Trust, and it's uh, part of the water conservation plan in marshes here. As we, uh, we, we, we've been in a, in a drought for a couple, three years, and have had some serious impacts on the levels of our lakes across the state. And although we have had a slight recovery, uh, actually, if you, today, Lake Hefner is just a, a little over a foot being full, and, and uh, uh, McGee Creek Reservoir is, is actually uh, near the flood pool, and, and we, we've had a pretty good recovery. Uh, Lake Canton has not recovered in the western part of the state. It's still down uh, uh, significantly. Um, and we don't know if it's going to continue or, or not continue, but we do know that we need to take some steps to, to use our water resources uh, wisely. And so the Water Trust over the last several months, uh, working with Mr. White and, and, and Mr. Ryan, have, have come forth with a plan, and Marsha is here to present to Council. Good, good morning, Mayor and Council. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, we're having a little technical difficulty, I think. Go ahead, Debbie. Shoot the next slide. Yeah, we've, we've booted up the wrong. Uh, let, me, let me go to the traditional method. My apologies. Um, it's most likely me. So today we'll talk about the water conservation plan, and particularly we're going to talk about outdoor water use restrictions. We are still in a drought. What drought means is less than normal rainfall. It's really kind of that simple. A water supply drought can be different from a, a, a crop drought a, because in water supply we need we need rain falling in the right places so there are lakes capture it while in uh, cropping irrigation you need water falling at the right time of year. The two very different things but nonetheless remain the same. We're in very rare territory in that our lakes have experienced some low lake levels this year that, that have never occurred before or have not occurred since the drought of the 1950s. That's a good thing. Um, we, we know that We'll get over this someday soon. The seasonal drought outlook tells us that things are going to improve, particularly in the eastern part of the state, over the next several months. Our water supplies come from McGee Creek Reservoir in southeastern Oklahoma, Lake Atoka also in southeastern Oklahoma, Lake Draper, Lake Hefner, Lake Oberholzer, and Lake Canton in northwest Oklahoma. It's the northwest supply that we have a little more concern about, again, because the drought continues in the northwest part of the state. Thank you. Back up. Map of the water, water supply lakes for your audience. Um, so again, the lakes are improving in the southeast, our lakes are full. Oh my, it just continues. Getting, getting to the point, what we're proposing, as, as the Water Trust, as Councilman um, White recommended several weeks ago and we did implement, we're in mandatory odd even outdoor use restrictions at all times now. This proposal presents additional restrictions as lake levels decline, should they continue to decline. Today we're at about 56% capacity and, and that capacity is calculated based on the volume of the lakes that can be treated through our water treatment plants. We propose that if we get to 50%, which could take as long as, with no rain from here on out, could take as long as 10 weeks, and a shorter time is about six weeks, that we go to a fixed two day a week lawn watering schedule. And again, if we drop another 5%, then we go to a fixed one day a week long watering schedule. Let's see if we can get to the next slide. Okay, so what this means, how, how we've built this program, is that for, if we get to two day a week watering, we would change from our odd even based on your house address, so that instead of every other day, you'll water uh, at maximum every three days with odd numbers on Saturday and Wednesday, even numbers on Sunday and Thursday, and all other users on Tuesdays and Fridays. If we get to level two, pardon me, level three, then we're talking about single family residences, that schedule getting more complicated. 
with two address numbers on Sunday, um, two even number addresses on Sunday, three even number addresses that are less common on Thursday, two odd numbers on Saturday, and the final three odd numbers on Wednesday with duplexes, homeowners associations, and triplexes watering on Tuesdays, and all others on Friday. What, what that kind of schedule does for us creates six watering days, and the day that is the highest demand typically in the system, which is Monday, while all of our industries and, and businesses are coming back online, is a non-watering day so that the system can recover and meet that natural demand that occurs with businesses every week. And next slide. So, uh, just a quick update, we continue to work on web editions, uh, offering courses at OSU, we're creating some rate structure options to bring you, bring through the water trust in the near future, and we'll come back with indoor conservation and customer incentives for indoor conservation at another time. City Manager? Just a couple of things to, to bring some perspective to, to this issue. Um, in the history of the water utility, I don't know if we've ever would have been in, if, we, if this had been in place, I don't know if we ever would have been in stage three. No, we would but, not have. So, so it would, if you go back and you apply this, we, we wouldn't be in, in a stage three situation. And I, I think we need to go, you know, we, we have a lot of water uh, reservoirs. We have six reservoirs, as, as Marsha pointed out on the earlier map. Canton is down right now, there's no doubt about that. Canton is uh, down... Uh, 14 feet? 14 feet, but it's also down 60,000 acre feet or, or, yes, or, or something in, in that range. That's a, that, that's a lot of water. Hefner's uh, almost full. It's with 1.3 feet from, from being full. Uh, Overholzer is such a small lake that it, it, its volume is, is really insignificant to the rest of the system. Draper is down, but Draper is down by design because of the fact that we redid all the pump stations on the Atoka pipeline a couple of years ago and didn't pump water for over a year. And, and it's come back. 10 or 12 feet from where it was, but it's, it's still down from where we would like it. Lake Atoka in the southeastern part of the state is down about 10 feet right now. And McGee Creek, the other lake in the southeastern part of the state, is full, if not Completely slightly, in the, into the flood mm -hmm. plain. And so we're pumping water right now from, from McGee Creek into Atoka, and then pumping water from Atoka to, to McGee Creek. I, I think the important thing to point out is if it, we have right now between 1.8 and 1.9 years supply of water usable water for 1.8, 1.9 years. And so it's, it's, we've, we've done a good job of resource planning in, in the past, and that's, you know, realistically, we don't expect that we were not gonna get any rain over the next nine, 1.9 years. But, you know, we, things happen. There, there has been some climate change issues out, out there. It's also interesting to point out, or important to point out, that half of our water comes from the western part of the state, from the North Canadian Basin. And the North Canadian Basin is clearly a decreasing yield. There's not as much water that comes down the North Canadian today as it did 50 years ago. Um, an example of that that's, that's very blatant is Lake Optima. Lake Optima is out in the panhandle of Oklahoma and has no water in it. When it was built, it was planned and there was enough flow that there would have water in it, but again, there's a decreasing yield in the North Canadian primarily attributed to all the uh, center pivot pumping of the, of the wheat farmers in, in western Kansas and, and, and uh, eastern Colorado and, and, and western Oklahoma and western uh, Nebraska have, have drawn that aquifer down and so there's less water that comes through it. We always assumed we had an 80,000 acre feet firm yield in the North Canadian Basin. Last year, which firm yield means that's what you're gonna get under the worst drought year. Last year, we only got 52,000 acre feet which is why there's not much water in, in, in Canton. There just isn't the water that came down that basin last year. And again, we take, we take some of that water, but most of that water is be, being consumed by agricultural uses in the West. Are we taking more water than we used to from the Northwest? Well, slightly, because we have had growth uh, in, in our system. And, and we historically have taken about half the water from the Northwest and half the water from the, the Southeast. However, there's less water available in the, in, in the Northeast, and we become more reliant upon the Southeast. Yeah, hindsight's always 2020, but if you knew how much precipitation we were going to get in April, would we still have done the drawdown from Canton? Yes. We did, we did the drawdown in February. What month did we do? When did we do the drawdown? It actually arrived in February. Yes, we would have. Um, the, 
forecast remains poor for this spring for the western watershed. Like, uh, like Hafner has taken all the water the river gave us through the winter months and is a foot and a half low, which is about seven, 8,000 acre feet of water low. Um, like Hafner is critical to our customers in the far northwest part of the system for service. So maintaining water there was, uh, was a critical action. Um, I, I wish that it hadn't been necessary. Obviously, it upset a lot of people. Um, again, we have about 10,000 acre feet of space left should the spring rains continue. We don't expect to miss any coming Is down it, the river. Would you see, would next year, you, if you had to draw down, you would do it around the same month, or would there be utility in waiting until after the April we, rains? Or? We haven't, we haven't in the past been able to wait until after the April rains. In this case, we really didn't think we could wait. Uh, actually, had we not made operational changes to stretch the water farther in the winter, we, we really thought we would have to take the water in January. We waited for rain so that we got the most water coming from Lake Canton actually arriving here. And it's about 70% of the water that's released there arrived. We uh, also, cha again, changed operations to minimize the, the amount of water the Lake Hefner plant produces. We made some, uh, we have been for months operating it at its minimum production level. And we tweaked it so that we produce actually less water from there right now than we have in the past. Thank you. Even though that's the least expensive water to treat. The southeast water is more expensive because of the energy costs associated with pumping that water up from Atoka to, or from McGee Creek to Atoka to Drake. I'm certainly hopeful we never get to level two because I can understand odd even and I think I can go to level two and figure out the couple of days, but I, that formula is going to be very difficult to, to We're teach with, people. We are working on um, public information about that, web improvements and a whole variety of things, but it is complicated. Uh, it, it's tremendously complicated. All right. Your Honor, just yes, a Pat. quick comment. Um, despite the city manager's uh, report that we've got 1.8 years of water supply in our system now, I think we, this is the time to start beginning to mold people's mind to the idea that we need to conserve water because we are in a water short region and the indications long term are that it's not going to get better. So we begin, need to begin to, to, to make people think about conservation before it's a necessity because if you wait till then, it's too late. So I think this uh, going to odd even day watering is a, is a minor step, but it is a step that it enforces in people's minds, I think, the need to conserve water when they can. And those people who have yard sprinkler systems ought to investigate uh, the, uh, in, the advances in drip irrigation. Uh, it would provide the same amount of water to your plants with a considerably lot less water running on the street or being evaporated in the air. So. Your Honor. Yes. Uh, and I agree with what's being said about a uh, public awareness. I just think we probably need to go beyond just the announcements that we can make on our website and through the mailings of the water bills and perhaps you or other members of the council or Mr. Couch could kind of hit the circuit as far as the uh, TV, the local news programs to communicate this as much as possible to the citizens. Uh, I just don't think we can talk enough about this process. And, and as Dr. Shadid brought up a couple of weeks ago, that, that we're talking about outside watering right now, but the, the, the larger use is the domestic indoor water. Correct. Use. There's other things that, 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 that Dr. Shadid talked a couple of weeks ago about. We right. need to be also educated to the public. And, and one other point, could we make a, 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 an analysis as to whether or not seeding of clouds should even be considered Yes, sir. I, I'm so sorry. I know that I owe you that. I, I apologize. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I mean, if it's just, if there's no evidence to support the use of that, that's fine. But if there is any possibility of increasing rainfall through that process, especially if we could somehow target the northwest of Oklahoma City and the, more into the Canton area, Canton Lake area, I'd say let's give it a try. And my question would be, when do you do it? Do you do it in the spring when there's more likely to have rainfall or do you do it in the summer months when we probably need it more but the opportunities to have clouds is just not as great uh, so the I'll, science it, we'll get you a report on that but the science is very mixed on, on it and, and it was more of a of a a couple of decades ago it was it was it was done more than than it is uh, 
No. If I'm wrong, you know, that's all right. I'll get that done. All right, we're ready to vote on item 8H. How about a motion? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8I is to declare surplus the weapon issued to Officer Chad Perry, who passed away recently, and it would go into the hands of his father. Is there a motion here? Yeah. All right. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8J, understand we do not need executive session? That's correct. All right. How about a motion then to move it forward? Cast your votes on the resolution, and it passed unanimously. Item 8K, understand we do need executive session? Yes. All right, cast your votes there, and that item moves to executive session. Item 8L, I understand we do need executive session? Yes. Cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. Item 8M, I guess we do not need executive session today. Cast your votes to strike item 8M, and that item is struck. And item 9 is items from council. James, anything for us today? All right. Ed? I'd just like to welcome, I understand, these are third graders, I understand. I'd like to welcome them to the council today. Um, and then I understand that we were going to have a, a meeting on May 21st, which would be to present the Nelson Nygaard bus routing uh, to the public. I believe that's at the downtown library on May 21st. Two meetings, one at 12 noon and one at 5 p.m. I would hope that we could could put the um, proposed routing on maybe the OKC Gov website for the public to uh, digest prior to that meeting. Thank you, mm -hmm. Larry. Hi. Yeah, just like to uh, congratulate the arts people. They had a great, I think, uh, arts festival last week. Uh, we got down a couple of nights. It was very, very. It was great to see all the people down there enjoying the uh, myriad gardens and then the art itself. And uh, my congratulations to them. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. David? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'd just like to uh, mention that Councilman Shadi and I were both fortunate enough to attend the press conference for the uh, uh, Plaza Mayor at the Crossroads uh, grand opening. Uh, I'm looking forward to the continued development of the uh, former Crossroads Mall uh, Raptor Properties is partnering with the uh, operators of a similar Hispanic uh, cultural and retail mall uh, in Fort Worth, also in uh, San Antonio, and also in Atlanta. Those malls draw over 200 miles, uh, draw customers from over 200 miles uh, away from their malls. And uh, we think, uh, I'm optimistic that uh, the one here in uh, I-240 and I-35 will be just as successful as, if not more. The quality of the mall itself is very good. Um, the owners are just very pleased with it. And if we can think back just a couple of years ago, that mall was very close to being considered to uh, be converted into some kind of a warehousing or distribution center. And for these uh, owners to take the risk of redeveloping it uh, is really uh, admirable, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, they are also, uh, in a longer term perspective, considering having an outdoor rodeo, which is very popular both among the Hispanic community, but throughout the central part of the uh, Great Plains in Texas, uh, throughout the Midwest. Uh, outdoor rodeos are very popular, and I've attended several of them, and they're just a lot of fun. So uh, I'm looking forward to great things from the new facility. Secondly, I'd like to thank the uh, board, as well as the volunteers of the Oklahoma City National Memorial Marathon. I got to run in it for the first time this weekend, and it was just a great experience. We got to meet a lot of people from outside of the Oklahoma City area. Uh, the volunteers and the staff do a tremendous job of providing support all along the route. Uh, it's a very efficiently uh, ran marathon. And for those who have never tried to run, and I didn't run the full marathon. I need to clarify Don't that. Don't tell that. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a relay, so I just ran 6.2 miles of it. But they do a great job. 
and uh, I'd like to commend them again. And it just puts a great uh, exposure on Oklahoma City, and it was also very pleasing to see so many of us wearing the red socks to, uh, you know, show support for the city of Boston and their marathon just a few weeks ago. And then finally, Mayor, I hope it's okay to uh, announce this, that, you know, your upcoming Mayor's Development Roundtable will be uh, May the 15th, and I hope as many people can attend that. Uh, it's in the morning of May the 15th. And two items of particular importance, not only to Ward 5 and Ward 4, where uh, Larry has the uh, airport trust, and then Ward 5 for the Envision 240 program, but also the entire city will see what's going on in South Oklahoma City, and uh, I think everyone will be surprised as to the developments that are taking place in the future for that part of Oklahoma City. Thank you. All right, thanks, David. Thank you. Yeah, Mayor, I also would like to echo the comments of my colleagues. We sure had a busy weekend in Oklahoma City. It was just fabulous. Um, so congratulations to the Arts Council. I think I worked on the food committee this year, and the food vendors had a great festival. So um, if they did, I'm sure the artists did as well. And uh, it was, despite Tuesday's very bad weather and Friday's torrential rain, I think everybody came out OK. Um, and the marathon as well. Uh, I had the privilege of welcoming the runners at 6 o'clock in the morning. And if anybody hasn't been there to the start, it just is one of the more moving things I've ever done. Um, there are 168 minutes of silence before the runners begin, and they actually added three seconds of silence for the Boston runners. We had folks from nine different countries and 47 states and at least a dozen runners that had run the Boston Marathon. And it was really a wonderful day, and Carrie Watkins and her staff at the Memorial just do such an amazing job. Downtown Oklahoma City was a buzz all day long. Um, Film Row also had their first um, final Friday walk, and there were almost as many people down in Film Row as you know I've seen uh, in the Paseo for the first Friday. So we've got another kind of anchor event. We've now got Paseo on the first Friday. We've got. Um, the Plaza District on the second Friday, and we've got Film Row, um, all of these coming together to bring people out um, in droves. Very exciting. And I'm, I see Robbie here in the audience. I'm really looking forward to the cultural report. Um, but manager, I wonder if we might be able to get a report um, on our 1% for public art. We are you know, moving forward into a stage with MAPS 3 that I think we've got some good numbers available, and I think it would be helpful for us all to get an idea of what the budgets for those various projects look like and some of the ideas that are beginning to surface. So to that that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. John? No, Mr. Mayor. All right. Pat? Your Honor, just a quick question. Um, has the city ever considered hiring a medical director? I know we've got a, a movement to improve the health of our employees, and we've got some excellent input from Dr. Shadid. But if we had somebody on staff full time, sort of uh, help us design an effective employee health program, uh, has that ever been considered by the city? I don't believe it has. Um, right now, we are we have solicited proposals for a, for an on-site clinic, and and so that would that there could be some connection with that. But uh, and those proposals are being evaluated at this point in time. Um, but I, I I don't think we have looked at that. Okay, but, you know, Dr. Shadid suggested at one time that we could, you know, have a clinic sort of operation to help some of our city employees, pharmacy kind of thing. Well, I think a, a medical director on staff would be really important if we wanted to go forward with that plan. Just comment. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks, Pat. I do want to mention uh, we have a class of third and fourth graders from St. John Episcopal, and Mrs. Emler. Ms. Mrs. Emler, would you raise your hand? Thank you for bringing your students down here today sure that television cameras have been able to get a shot of them. We appreciate your interest in, in what we do. Um, city manager reports. Several this morning. Uh, we're going to start with Robbie Kinzel, who's going to give us a report on the cultural plan and the community arts study. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, you will find this report very helpful. Um, well, I'll, I'll start by saying, Robbie Kenzel, I'm the liaison for arts and cultural affairs in the Oklahoma City Planning Department, for those of you that don't know me. Um, this re report will be very helpful for you um, when making decisions about neighborhoods, parks, schools, and potentially programming for MAPS3 wellness centers. 
I want to start with a little background about the cultural plan itself. Um, the Cultural Development Corporation of Central Oklahoma is a nonprofit that operates outside of the city, and they do two major things. They plan and implement plans and have done that for the city for over 10 years. And then they also study the economic impact of the arts. They're a research arm. And so the last cultural plan was commissioned by the city in 2009 and presented to council in 2010 and has been being implemented since that time. There are five major initiatives in the study. This, this initiative, number four, Amplify Lifelong Learning, is what I'll be reporting about to you today. But I thought I'd go ahead and briefly mention the other initiatives. Initiative one, Energize the Atmosphere, is all about artist support services, and council has received the artist support study. And it's about facilities for artists and arts organization to help them grow and thrive. Maximize what exists, initiative number two, is about creating a city position for arts and cultural affairs, which council did um, beginning July 1st of last year, and also a comprehensive plan for implementing the 1% for Art program, which the Cultural Development Corporation in the city applied for a National Endowment for the Arts grant earlier this year, and we hope to find out in June if we will be the recipient of that. Entice, attract, and entertain, this is about growing audiences, and helping uh, visitors, tourists, and families uh, understand what is going on in, in the city, uh, in cultural districts, art districts, and by organizations. This is being implemented right now. There's a 30-person uh, group of outstanding marketers led by Cynthia Reed at the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber and Sandy Pantlick with Oklahoma City University. And they're about halfway through their work. And then, um, amplify lifelong learning, the lifelong learning in the arts, um, and then the last initiative, support and sustain, this will launch in the fall. So a little background for you on the community arts program. Um, the Arts Council of Oklahoma City has been operating a community arts program since the 90s. Um, they take arts to the community instead of relying on traditional venues for those arts to happen. They were looking for a way to refresh their program and they wanted to, uh, to look at a 10-year strategic uh, program study to make improvements and they hired a national consultant, Diane Matarazza. They were funded by, locally by the Kirkpatrick Family Fund and the Cultural Development Corporation of Central Oklahoma to do this study. The per current program partners with over 10 organizations and hires over 25 roster artists, serves 17,000 citizens at 40 sites, and you usually see the program in libraries, parks, public schools, at nonprofit agencies like the YMCA or this, the after school uh, Boys and Girls Club, and in neighborhood programs. And this is a good geographic snapshot so you can see where those programs, all the colored squares are where the programs are concentrated, and then other programs um, that are similar, non-affiliated programs are in gray. For the timeline and the process uh, that was used for this study, there was a 20-member project leadership team, and the team was led by former councilman Gary Mars and Sherry Rice Rhodes with the St. Anthony Foundation. There were 20 hours of interviews interviews either in person or by phone by the consultant. She conducted 51 focus groups with 324 participants. And then there were extensive community-wide surveys, both uh, hard copy surveys and online because they wanted to reach a really wide audience with the surveys. And the surveys were also in two languages to assure a broader reach. And for the timeline, the steering committee met from May to August of last year to design the program. And then the surveys and the interviews and the focus groups were carried out through the fall into the winter months and the, and the study was completed in February. So here's what they found. Um, the, the bridges to connect the creative sector supply with the underserved population's demand would, would be positive for Oklahoma City residents. And what they found was that the creative sector's knowledge of what neighborhood organizations needed to reach the underserved, it, they were, it was inadequate. 
and that there are 300, over 350 nonprofit service agencies serving 139,000 persons in poverty or at risk, and they have little or no knowledge of the arts organization's outreach programs. The next thing was that a lot of people don't know about the program. Um, the Arts Council needs to have a comprehensive branding strategy and a web-based directory promoting the educational opportunities and the resources. The surveys revealed that the community awareness of programming is very low, even though it's out there. They're not well informed, and so that lack of information is a real barrier. Community arts programs could also benefit from the support and influence of Oklahoma City's movers and shapers. And this was intentionally that it was not shakers, that it was shapers. Um, those who make things happen in this community have not really gotten behind arts education. And so a greater case needs to be made. Um, this is a community with a very big heart. We have a higher per capita giving rate than other communities, yet sustainable funding for arts education, in spite of the benefits that have been reported, is very difficult, so. And then one size does not fit all. Um, the plan suggests a greater facilitator role for the Arts Council of Oklahoma City. They have done a very good job with this program over 10 years although acknowledging it can always be improved, but they could serve as more of a broker and a networker for helping other agencies and neighborhood organizations and schools benefit from the program and giving it a greater reach. So here's what the pro program priorities are that have been designed from this study. Certainly stronger creative sector partnerships, increased access, awareness, networking, the allies and the champions, and then continuing to improve overall quality. The Arts Council wants to focus on its existing sites and really make them perform really well and then use those as tests, as models for the other partners and allies that may want to replicate the program. Here's a snapshot, a diagram of what that kind of brokerage and networking opportunity could look like. And so the next steps are making the case, um, providing more evidence about the, the greater need for financial supports for community arts education, um, certainly partnering with the Oklahoma City Public Schools, especially in the city's strong neighborhood initiative areas in, that um, we're working on through the planning department. And then also this summer, the Arts Council's board will be conducting a strategic planning session. And in this retreat, they will try to look at a way to kind of model a sustainable funding stream and really get behind this program. So at this point, I put the, uh, the link to the full report um, on the city's website. It's at okc.gov forward slash arts. And this will be available as you're talking to people and you might want them to be able to find the report, the surveys. Um, but I'd also like to introduce two very important people to the study in case you have questions. And, and while you're asking them questions, I'll be handing out a full report to you. Um, the first is Sharon Askren. And she is the Community Arts Program Director with the Arts Council of Oklahoma City. So she's been very busy here in the last week. Coming up here. And she was the program manager through the study, working with the consultant coordinating all the activities, and um, will also implement the plan. And then the other person I'd like to present is Sherry Rice Rhodes, who was one of the co-chairs of the steering committee. Sherry's with St. Anthony's Foundation. And so some of the questions that I thought that you might have is, what would it need to make the program happen? How long will it take? Is the plan feasible? And what some of the biggest obstacles are? You may have other questions too, but I'll be handing out the report. Um, while you're Your Honor, I have a question. One of the next steps that, that was outlined on the, on the screen was uh, uh, integrating the plan somehow with the Oklahoma City Public Schools. Yes. Has that step started yet? <coughs> That has, and actually, we're currently in three Oklahoma City public schools um, where we solely work with them, and then we're in four more where we partner with the schools and the YMCA. 
to deliver the program. So we already have that relationship and um, we hope to expand this fall into six more sites with Oklahoma City Public Schools. Do you have any plans ultimately to try to touch all the schools? I'm sorry? Do you have any plans to ultimately touch all the schools? No. That would be wonderful. And there are 55 elementary schools. That's mostly where we are right now. Um, we haven't tackled middle school or high school yet. Um, but certainly we would like to do that. We've started um, with something sustainable and achievable right now. And um, we are having ongoing conversations with um, Deanne Davis and with the staff over there. Um, we would like nothing better than to see that happen. And I think that the district also is working on an, an entire after school strategy um, on their side as well. So we would hope to collaborate with them as they develop that. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I do yes, have John. one uh, quick question. You mm -hmm. indicate Oklahoma City Public Schools, but however, um, we do have other school districts um, within Oklahoma City. Uh, in Ward 7, I have several uh, school districts, so I hope at some point uh, you all will reach out to other school districts besides Oklahoma City Public Schools. Actually, we're in Choctaw and Nakoma Park as well. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah, so, Sherry, something dear to your heart would be the Oklahoma City Public Schools Foundation, and uh, is there a connection that we can make there and potentially access some funding or programming? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'll speak. I used to be with the Oklahoma City Public Schools Foundation. I'm sure Sharon would know that, but I think there certainly would be a possibility for, I think, a funding stream to go through the foundation. Uh, I know in the past there have been specific dollars that were allocated for the arts. I mean, we'll remember our our talent show that we did many years ago. So I think that would be a strong possibility. Mm -hmm. And we have a steering committee that is, I'm sorry if you can't hear me, we have a steering committee that is forming right now to kind of lead and advise and, and steer this program. And uh, Lori Dickinson, who is uh, who took Sherry's place at the foundation, is involved in that. She was actually on the assessment. Wonderful. Right, so they are absolutely very involved. I think that you know some of the key words that we hear all the time are these collaborations, and we have so many people that are interested in this important subject, but bringing them together and building those bridges is going to be the key to our success. So. Well, and I would like to say that the, the real intent of the committee when we brought everyone together was to involve and have participation from individuals who represented organizations, constituencies. Mm -hmm. And some were unaware of the program, others were very aware of the program, but by the end of the process, they were all quite engaged. And mm -hmm. I think we'll have that continued participation. Right. And on a just very quick other subject, I was delighted to see that the surveys went out, both in English and Spanish. Did you get some good feedback from the Hispanic community? And We did, we right. did. Um, and we had to work to get that feedback, honestly. It was difficult. Um, and one of the things that we became aware of, not just with the Hispanic community, but also working with Valerie Thompson at the Urban League, is that there is really a digital divide and a lot of people don't have access to computers. And so we made a real effort to get hard copies out to um, the Latino Development um, Community Agency and um, some other um, agencies kind of helped us get the word out. We would have liked to have had more, but we did get enough to be statistically significant. I'm just so. thinking out loud, but now that we've got Plaza Mayor on the drawing board, you know, maybe yes. there's an opportunity to create some kind of an art space there that would help us access. And we actually it. had a focus group meeting there Good. with those folks with our uh, assessment person. Great, thank so. you. Sounds like you've covered a lot of bases. We tried. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Larry. Yeah, just uh, what, what John said earlier, uh, Ward 3 uh, has a very small population of uh, I-89 school children in it, but we have Putnam City, as, as Pat does, uh, and uh, Western Heights, uh, James has, uh, and I, and Mustang schools. I, I'm just wondering, are, are you all so focused, and maybe right now to implement this, Robbie, you have to be focused, but is there a plan really to take this to the rest of the kids in Oklahoma City who are not represented by the I-89 school district? I think that'll be one of the things that the Arts Council will need to focus on is in its strategic planning session because always resources are going to be the obstacle to that. So like you said, they will, they will start small 
And I think the, the consultant highly recommended that the, the small startup be very focused on quality, excellence, and then reaching out to partners that can help them, you know, without, um, you know, making um, the Arts Council's financial situation weaker, but certainly kind of having that program developed in a way that some of these other agencies and groups can help, you know, spread the program in other areas. So. Mm -hmm. And I would also add that we've really tried to focus on underserved schools and underserved populations. And by that I mean, um, typically the schools that we're in are greater than 90% free and reduced lunch. So these are very needy students who don't have access to the arts. And that, that really is gonna be our focus. We, we want to reach out to children who just wouldn't have those opportunities otherwise. Well, when you look at some of the demographics of the uh uh, Putnam City Schools mm -hmm. and also the Western Heights Schools for two that I'm familiar with and I see John over there also uh, I think you'll find that underserved does not just stay in I-89. Oh, I agree. And I, I agree. And I have to agree with you because in um, Ward 7 I also have Millwood Public Schools which fits that category. I also right. have uh, Cricket Oak which fits that category. So there are other uh, school districts uh, that fits those. Uh, category. So sure. again, at some point, uh, I would like to see, and I'm sure Larry and, and several others would like to see, uh, for those schools, districts that fix that uh, need category, that you all implement the program there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. We're on to the budget, and uh, this is the time of year where we introduce the budget. This year's um, budget has some milestones to it that we, we, we have not reached in the past. Um, the general fund dollar amount exceeds $400 million for the first time, and the total budget exceeds a million dollar, a billion dollars, excuse me, it's hard for me to get out, a billion dollars for the first time. Um, just to, as, as before Doug goes on, on the overview with you, there, there's some things I really want to highlight uh, in the budget. It, it, it's, it's, I want to, give you a, a uh, just a nutshell of, of what's in the budget because it's it, it isn't um, significantly uh, there aren't significant changes this year we were, have moderate growth rates uh, in, in revenue and because of that we were a, a, a able to add a, a few things but primarily we're, we're the budget uh, is, is very similar to the service of which we provide in the past this budget has 51 additional positions in it 11 of those are in enterprise accounts, seven in water and four in airports. And so that leaves a net increase of 40, which are 40 new police officers that are added to the budget. Now there's a couple of deducts and adds in the remainder of the budget where we shifted some resources around, but essentially there's 51 new positions, 40 of those are police officers, and 11 of those are in the enterprise accounts of water and in, 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 in airports. So we're, we have the same service levels generally we provide in the past, with the exception that we were able to add 40 new police officers and we put a million dollars in for transit. A couple of weeks ago, Nelson Nygaard presented a, a, a transit plan to us in conceptual form, and there, there, there needs to be uh, further study and further decisions made on that, but we do know that it's gonna take some amount of money to implement that study, and it, a million may not be enough but it will be a start toward the implementation of that. And so any additional revenues we have essentially are going into two areas, and that's police and, and, and to transit. Um, we begin with the presentation today. Next week on, uh, on May 7th, we'll have three department presentations. It'll be uh, IT, police, and development services. And then we'll also cancel the meeting on the 21st of May for further budget presentations by departments and also the sixth or the fourth of June we will cancel and have additional budget presentations we will introduce the budget that day for adoption on June 11th and Doug can you give us the highlights all right well I'm pleased to be here before you to present the FY 14 budget for the city of Oklahoma City and before I begin I'd just like to ask my staff and my team here from Office of Management and Budget if they'd stand up I'd like to just recognize everybody who was a part of putting this together. It's a lot of hard work and uh, long hours, and I appreciate all their dedication to putting this together. So thank you, guys. So uh, 
As Mr. Couch uh, noted, uh, a couple of the highlights here. Again, our economy is still doing well, and that's allowed us to uh, maintain and, and do some enhancements to service levels, specifically the 40 additional police positions and the million dollars for transit. If you take the 33 uh, uniform positions that were added in the current budget, plus the 40 that are proposed for next fiscal year, that's a 7% increase in police uniform positions over the, uh, these two years, uh, which would leave us with, a t or which would put us at a total of 1,116 uniform police officers would be our authorized staffing levels uh, next fiscal year. The million dollars uh, for transit, as Mr. Couch mentioned, uh, it would be for program enhancements. It's not specifically targeted at this point. That would be up to the council's decision as to where that would be focused. Uh, but that represents about a 7.7 percent increase in transit funding next year. Uh, as Mr. Couch mentioned, specifically the general fund, $400 million is our budget for next year. The other operating funds are just under $260 million. Our non-operating, which is mostly our capital funds, $414 million for a total of $1,027.9 million as our total budget for next year. Uh, before we turn to some of the details, I'd just like to take a kind of a a look at the process that got us to where we are. Each year, you can, as we start with our citizen survey that uh, goes out during the summer months, and we get a report back. Then this last fall, the council uh, met to determine their priorities uh, at using that citizen survey and other inputs uh, for that decision. That, those council priorities feed into strategic business plans, which the departments develop to guide their operations and their budget requests. So when the city manager's office and the departments uh, and the office of management budget were reviewing those requests, we're looking at those council priorities to put together the proposed budget. Of course, during the year, uh, we're going through and collecting data on how departments are doing. We're reporting on that to you regularly and to the city manager's office, evaluating our progress and making decisions on how we move forward there. So uh, with that in mind, I just thought I'd hit quickly the five priorities that the city council adopted last fall um, and that they are provide a safe and secure community, maintain strong financial management, promote thriving neighborhoods, develop a transportation system that works for all citizens, support high quality public education and community health and wellness. And you'll see on the slide here, we've got some new icons for each priority. The Public Information and Marketing Office helped us develop these, and we're, we use those throughout the budget book, uh, and we'll be using those in our presentations uh, for future leading for results uh, presentations. Uh, to kind of highlight the areas where we're tying in with the city council priorities. And so I appreciate the, uh, uh, the new uh, icons that Public Information and, and Marketing Office uh, uh, provided for us. And you'll see the big enhancements in the budget. More police officers fits under that provide a safe and secure community. Enhanced transit funding is working on developing a transportation system that works for all citizens. So we're, we're very focused on the city council's priorities this year. Let's take a look at the revenues. Um, again, our overall budget's uh, just over a billion dollars and supported primarily by taxes. Taxes total $568 million, or about 55% of the total. And as you know, sales tax is the largest category, uh, and that's over $417 million of our total budget. Uh, now, when you look at the total budget, uh, the taxes category also includes property taxes in our debt service fund that go to pay off our GO bonds. That totals $77.6 million in property taxes. Fees and charges include things like franchise fees, business licenses, building permits, ambulance membership fees, stormwater drainage fees. They account for just under 16% of the total. The transfers in category consists of transfers from the public trust that support operations for water, wastewater, solid waste, and airport services. Federal grants are a fairly small portion of our budget, about 3.3%, and a total about $34 million. And then fund balance represents a pretty big chunk of our budget at just under 16% or $162.8 million. And some of the funds that have budgeted significant amounts of fund balance include the MAPS-3 sales tax at about $49 million, the City and Schools Capital Project Use Tax at $14.3 million, uh, and our Capital Improvement Projects funds at, a fund at $25.3 million. So as we look at the uh, operating revenue, uh, the operating portion that focuses on, on our people and the operations of our, our city totals about $621 million. Taxes, again, the largest source of revenue, uh, totaling $373.9 million. And again, sales tax being the majority of that, $309 million. Uh, the other taxes in that category include our use tax, hotel motel tax, and we also receive portions of some other taxes through the state. 
uh, such as alcoholic beverage, uh, tobacco, excise tax, motor fuels. Uh, fees and charges are a bigger chunk of the operating budget at 25.8%, and transfers again from those trusts supporting operations total 13.8%, and other revenues such as interest is a minuscule 0.2% of our revenue. Doug, give me a primer on the difference between the uh, general fund and the operating. Uh, so yeah, the operating fund is, is our most flexible fund where we fund most of our police, fire, public works types of services. The operating fund pulls in then uh, those things like the airport operations, water and wastewater operations, the police and fire sales taxes that are dedicated just for police and fire use. And so those are sources that are focused and dedicated to a specific purpose, but they still support our operations. And so that's why that operating budget is at $621 million. Our general fund budget, again, about $400 million is the biggest piece of that. And again, where we have the most flexibility. But those other operating funds do provide critical services for our citizens there as well. Uh, when we look at the general fund, uh, sales tax now becomes even more important uh, at uh, about 54% uh, of our total, $214 million. Our other taxes category, the biggest piece there is our use tax, which is $34.6 million. Uh, franchise fees represent 10% of the total. They come from the utility companies that pay us for the use of our rights of way uh, and for the exclusive franchise uh, that they receive. Fines total $23 million and represent uh, just under 6% of the general fund revenue. Uh, fees and charges such as building permits, administrative charges, the wage adjustment from fire and police sales tax make up 16% of the total. And then other revenue, uh, and again, interest and other miscellaneous uh, fees, or not fees, other, other sources, uh, generates about 2.3% of our total. As we turn to the expenditure side of the budget, again, uh, we get the, the Municipal Budget Act, the state law that governs the way we budget, mandates that we use these categories to group our budget together. And so personal services is all the cost of our personnel, and that's the biggest piece of it is 43%. Other services uh, at 15.7%. Um, and uh, capital outlay, when you look at the total budget, is a significant portion of our budget at just under 25%. Again, when you look at the whole budget, you also see our debt service on our GO bonds uh, is about 9% uh, of the total there on expenses. Uh, when we look at it by service area, uh, public safety is the largest percentage of our operating budget um, at uh, about 52%. Uh, and that includes police, fire, municipal courts, and the uh, animal welfare uh, division of development services. Public services are nearly a third of the total. That includes airports, utilities, public works, development services, and planning. Culture and recreation includes parks and recreation, the zoo, sales tax, hotel motel taxes for convention and tourism spending, and support for the operation of Chesapeake Energy Arena and the Cox Business Services Convention Center. Those make up about 11% of the total. And finally, general government includes those functions in the general fund that support the frontline departments, but they're more the behind the scenes departments, such as finance, personnel, legal, city manager's office, and auditor's office. They make up about 6% of the total. As we zoom in a little bit closer on the general fund, public safety becomes a larger portion of that pie at 64.3%. Um, general government also gets a little bit bigger as, again, all those functions uh, that support the, the line operations in general government are within the general fund, so that's up just under 9%. Uh, one area that's smaller is public services at 17%, and again, that's because the things like utilities, stormwater drainage, and airports are part of that operating budget. They're not within the general fund. And then finally, culture and recreation in the general fund is the Parks and Recreation Department and the Cox, the Cox Convention Center and the Chesapeake Energy Arena make up our cultural and recreation portion there. When we use those Municipal Budget Act categories again, gen personal services uh, is the biggest portion at 73% of our budget. Other services is 20.3%. That includes things like utilities, contracts for service, our payments to COTPA, those sorts of things. Um, the supplies and capital and transfers are all fairly small, total about 6.3% of the general fund budget. I would like to point out that the, the funding that we have in the general fund for capital is $5 million but we do that as a transfer to the Capital Improvement Projects Fund. So when you look at the budget in this manner, that's categorized in the transfers category rather than capital. When it gets spent in the Capital Improvements Fund, uh, that's where it shows up as capital. Uh, as we look at our positions, uh, we have an increase of 51 positions, 40 of those uniform police positions. That puts our total at 4,580 positions, 
And on the chart, I've kind of added uh, some of the totals from previous years going back to 2002, which was our previous high water mark uh, for positions. Um, and uh, just as a kind of as a note, uh, in 2002, the population of the city was 521,000. It's now estimated about 605,000, which is an increase of about 16%. Uh, during that same time frame, our number of employees has grown by less than 1%. And as we noted at the uh, council workshop in February, uh, and in the follow-up to that, you know, Oklahoma City has a fairly low number of employees per 1,000 citizens when compared with our peer cities. Our ratio is 7.62 employees per 1,000 citizens compared with the average of our peer cities of 10.16 employees per 1,000 citizens. So, uh, our budget book follows pretty much the same format as it has in the years past, but I thought I'd just take a couple of minutes to flip through it just to kind of familiarize you with what's in there. You can see on our cover, uh, PIM also did our uh, cover for us. We've got our priorities. Uh, and, and you'll note that uh, kind of our tagline uh, here for our budget book is focused on priorities. And that's what we really are in this budget, is very focused on council priorities. Um, near the beginning of the budget book on page five is the transmittal uh, message from the city manager's office. And this walks through all of the uh, things that are contained in the budget in terms of changes, as well as some of the programs that are ongoing that really uh, support those five uh, council priorities. And so uh, I encourage you to take a look through that to just kind of see the highlights of what's in the budget book. Um, each department is listed here. We've got a tab for department budgets, and we've got detailed information about uh, each of the departments. I might direct your attention that we just might walk through one of them. That's the finance department on page 157. Finance is, of course, near and dear to my heart, and uh, since they won't be making a presentation uh, this year, I thought I'd uh, just walk through the finance department. We start on page 157 with kind of an organizational structure for the department and our mission. And on the next page, we go with the issues, the strategies, and results that uh, the department has, uh, that finance has outlined in their strategic business plan, which we uh, talked about earlier as part of our process. So these are the issues that the finance department sees impacting them and their customers. Uh, in the coming years. And you'll note on uh, page 158 and 159, we've got some strategic results, and we've got, again, those city council priority icons highlighting those measures that tie directly to council priority, in this case, of uh, providing strong financial management. Um, on the coming pages, on page 161, we've got the major budget changes identified for the department in terms of position changes or other significant funding changes. Um, and we call those out there. And then on the following page, we do both expenditures and positions by those lines of business, those divisions within the department, as well as by the source of their funds. So how much of funding does the, general, or does the finance department get from the general fund? How much is in the risk management internal service fund and the capital improvement project funds to get to that total? So we identify not only where we spend it, but where we get the revenue for, those, uh, for that spending. And then the, uh, the back section of each department walks through each line of business uh, within that department, each division, talks about some of their measures, reviews their performance in, in, specific, in, in those specific uh, result and output measures that they've identified. And in, some, in several of the lines of business, we, we go into a little more depth about some of their key uh, measures and talk about those and why they're important, uh, what those measures tell us. And then finally, the budget by program, which is that lower level within the line of business kind of those specific sections that do the work um, uh, within that line of business. And so that kind of each, each, each department is organized that way. The departments are in there alphabetically. So if you're looking for uh, details on any department's budget, it should be relatively easy to find there in that department section. The next section we have uh, with a tab there is our fund summary section. This goes through and uh, highlights each fund that the city has uh, starts, if we look at page 414, we look at the airports pro is the first fund that we list here. This is the format that the Municipal Budget Act requires us to put our budget in, and this is the budget that will be adopted when we bring an item to you. You'll see it looks just like this uh, layout here on page 414 in each of these uh, following pages where we go through the revenues and the expenditures for each fund and by department within that fund, and again, using those categories that the Municipal Budget Act requires of personal services, other services and charges, supplies, capital outlay, and transfers. So, and, and again, we show the prior year's actuals, FY12 actuals, our current year budget, and then what we have proposed uh, for next fiscal year. 
The uh, final section with uh, the new information in it is our capital budget section, which follows that tab behind it. And that uh, is, uh, just gives you an idea, if you want to look and see, of the major capital projects that are planned to be undertaken in the following, in the coming year, FY14, by department, um, that is, is a comprehensive list uh, of all the capital it's undertaking because that is such a significant portion of what we do there. So again, I know it's a lot, uh, a lot of information in the budget book. Um, we'll have this out on OKC.gov uh, following the meeting, so it'll be available for the public uh, as well to uh, go through. Uh, be happy to uh, work with you all also if you have any questions or uh, concerns about the information that's in there. Uh, as Mr. Couch noted, uh, next week we'll have development services, IT and police presenting their budget. And then we have uh, the two weeks following that, public works, parks and recreation and utilities. And then finally on June 4th, fire airports and public transportation and parking will present their budgets uh, to the council with adoption scheduled for June 11th. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions um, or turn it back to the city manager. All right. Questions for Doug? Just a quick comment. I think you all did another excellent job of, of summarizing this in such a uh, precise manner, both the graphics and the financial information you have in here is, is very easy to follow, Doug, so I appreciate all the work that you did. And, and it's important, I think, to note that we've really reached a milestone with a billion dollar total budget. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hmm? Else? All right, all right Doug. Thank you. thank you all. Thank you, and you'll be seeing Doug again next week. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to highlight the sales and use tax report. Uh, for April, it was not a good sales tax check for it. It, it was down. Uh, it was actually um, down uh, seven percent under target, four point two percent under last year. Um, again, one month doesn't a trend make, but that's it's not particularly positive. But we've had some strong revenues to date. I was hoping that with a little stronger check, we may have been able to up our projections a little bit and add some additional services to the budget. But right now we're, we're not able to do that so uh, i don't know uh, again we we don't know if this is long long term or not we don't think so the, the the big cloud that's out there i think right now is sequestration and 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 the, and the effects of that and i think it's more perceptual than actual at this point but it could become actual over the next couple of months and it's something we need to watch very careful that was taken into consideration on our revenue projections for next year we had a range based upon we're on, on sequestration, and we, 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 we took a middle range position on that based upon our uh, economist uh, projections with, with that in, in, in consideration. Do we, do we had a string of 18 months without a, de is this our first decrease in 18 months? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's just one month. It is just one month. You know, I, you know every time, a check comes in, we try to analyze it, we try to figure out what it is, and you know, there's just many times we really don't know what happened and, and, and why. C man reports concluded? It, they are. All right, let's move on to items. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, from citizens to be heard. We have two people that have signed up to speak. Uh, Michael? Winston? Yes, Winston Michael Ray. First of all, being so mighty God, I know I'm not I'm going to. Uh, and, and Winston, yeah. we will need your name and address for the record, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, my name is Winston Michael Ray, and I'm presently residing at the City Rescue Mission, located at 800 West California Street, here in your illustrious city of Oklahoma. Having said that, my obedience to Almighty God, I always take him with me, as my grandmother taught me from knee high. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be real brief in the length of time I have, because what I'm about to say I think will hopefully change the course of direction that this nation should be taking. I'm deliberately protesting homelessness. And the best way I can protest homelessness in this country and throughout the world for that matter is looking the way I'm looking. I don't usually look this way. You go to youtube.com, type in Winston for President 2012, I can assure you'll see a much more groom Winston Michael Ray. But having said that, Operation Hobo, acronym Homeless One, Barack Obama. He's tied into this campaign whether he wants to or not. He has tons of information on it. Uh, I've been sending him um, before this term, starting at, at the beginning of, of his first term. Mr. Mayor, distinguished counsel, 
this city is being divinely charged to launch and possibly lead a worldwide marketing movement called not civil, C-I-V-I-L. Those days are gone, and it's my job to see that they're gone and gone very quickly. Worldwide silver rights movement, S-I-L-V-E-R, dollar sign S. We're looking at a marketing movement that can generate from, from what the experts have shared with me over my 25 years of doing this, well over $2 trillion. Time won't allow me to get into how and, but just let's say marketing undeniable, incontrovertible intelligence information that has literally, I repeat, literally been marketed, will be marketed. We have a lot on, on your city and, and leaders of your city, you as well, Mr. Mayor Cornett. But having said that, what I am sending out the call for is for every citizen who is watching this broadcast or will be watching it, I don't, I don't know if it's live, I was told it was live, to have a citywide call in. Call your office, uh, inquire about it. I've left information with, 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 your, with your staff. Uh, we're ready to end America's civil rights era. It simply serves no purpose. And as the worldwide civil rights leader, which I have been divinely dubbed by the Almighty, I won't leave him out on anything. Um, um, I am responsible for getting this to, to, to the city leaders. Now, I need a dance partner, and in here, you can't see it from where you're at, but you will get a copy, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you, you, it's, these are the fax covers, but this is the information. You can't see it from there, but I'll have your secretary make a copy. All right. Governors have this information, 15 other governors. I'm sending out the call, and I've called, I have my little cell phone here and everything, uh, to ask that whatever governor is the first to broadcast this from their state, Nevada, California, uh, 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 the, the states I sent to Nevada isn't one of them. Uh, that would be the first state that the movement will do business with. This is a marketing movement that will end homelessness and, you ready for this, pay off city and states deficits. Now for those who are not taking this seriously, and I'm not saying any of you are doing that because I think it's the first time you, and yes, Madam, uh, Ms. Meg Slayer, you're, you're the councilwoman over my district where all of this is coming out, city rescue mission. I want you to know that. This is an intelligence operation. KGB now means Kingdom for Godly Business. The Russians have been informed. I've sent it to Ambassador Kishlak. I can go on and on time, won't allow it. Yeah, but the, Winston, can, can you wrap it up? Can you give I'm us gonna a wrap it up to you right now. Right, thanks. I would like for you, Mayor Mick Cornett and Governor Mary Fallon to stand with me. This month, this Thursday, thunderous Thursday, not weather-wise, to say that Oklahoma is the first state in the union and all, in the world at large, there's the states everywhere, to embrace the worldwide silver rights movement. And I'm, I'm sending out that call. I'm asking every um, one who hears this to, with all due respect, uh, bombard the telephones of the councilmen and, and mayors. And just, you know, you have the, the, the title, Oklahoma Sooner. Uh, I want you to keep living by that time. I know about 1889, the rush to get the land and so forth. I read all of that. I, 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 I love history. I, love history. I never want to leave my history class. Uh, uh, if you and Mayor and, and Governor Mary Fallon be the first to stand with me, indeed, Oklahoma will be the first state to embrace civil rights, S-I-V-E-R, sooner than the rest. Having said that, let me leave my number for if anyone want to call. Winston Michael Ray, area code 405-436-3254. And you can also reach me at the city rescue mission, and I don't have that before me. So uh, there's much more to be said. Just let's say that uh, trying to get the budget straight, America will never, never, Winston, never. Winston, I'm going to have to wrap you up. But thanks for coming down, and I hope people got your phone number. OK. And I would like to meet with you. When can I meet with you personally on this, Mr. Mayor? Is there any way I can meet with you within 24 hours on this? Probably not likely, but I appreciate the information, and we'll look at it. OK. Thanks. Thank you. Joe Sarge Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Joe Sarge Nelson, Oklahoma City. I've been here before. Uh, Y'all, I do believe, have a manila folder with this item in it. It consists of five pages. The first page was when I was back here on the 9th, and uh, part of it states what I stated to you all in reference to the horse slaughter. Fortunately, yesterday I had lunch with Congressman Langford, and I was on the phone last night to uh, Lacey J. Dalton, and she's quite famous. And uh, 
She's got a film out in reference to this very item. I uh, briefly spoke to your city manager earlier and uh, asked if I could show this film when I arrived, and he assured me that uh, this particular item that I am opposing to uh, ban here in Oklahoma City will never get here anyway. But I also have here, if you uh, would glance through it, you will find that I have a resolution and it uh, pretty well states how we feel here as the citizens of Oklahoma City. I've talked to quite a lot of them. And on the last page, it's a draft of the ordinance. Very simple, direct. And I would like very much for this council to take a vote on this thing and make it official. We'll be the first city of Oklahoma and its capital to ban horse slaughtering in this state. Uh, the governor made it very clear. I've talked to uh, Jennifer Fallon's office that we can do this, and it was made public not only on television, but as well as in the newspaper. And I'd like for Oklahoma City and the esteemed mayor of this city and our council to adopt this resolution and the ordinance and make it official by a ballot or voting. It's quite plain that we're not going to have a, a horse slaughter in Oklahoma City ever because that is our heritage. That is a big part of it. In fact, the gentleman that just left this podium, <laughs> these little fellows make a lot of money for Oklahoma City. In fact, if you were out here this last weekend, there was something like two to 300 horse trailers out at the fairgrounds. And this is our part of our livelihood and our culture. And if you all would take the time to consider and vote on it, I would greatly appreciate it. Mr. Mayor? Mm -hmm. We have executive session. We'll be back. We have returned from executive session and we are adjourned.